How's it going everybody? Raising Hell here and today we're going to be taking a look at the Polish Civilization DLC for Civilization 6. This is going to be pretty much as comprehensive a reveal as I'm going to do for the DLC. It's more than a first impressions though and I think you should be aware of that. So to make sure that you have your DLC downloaded and enabled, simply go to additional content and it should appear right here. For me it's the third one but it might be the second one for you under DLC Poland Civilization Pack, New Civilization and Leader. Jad Wiga of Poland. It's a difficult word for me to pronounce. Once it's enabled, go ahead and go to single player. You can either create a game or load a game if you previously had a game with that civilization enabled when you created it. So for example, if we go to load a game and take a look at one of my civilizations, say my very first one, you'll look down here in the additional content category and you'll see that if you load this civilization, the additional content that the Jad Wiga or Polish DLC provided uh, is no longer there. So you have to make sure that it's enabled and then you can create a game. Anyway, I have a couple of games started here. So first we're going to be taking a look at the Polish Civ. Okay, so I think it's important to make a distinction here between the Polish Civ and the later Jadwiga because they both have different abilities and as we've seen with Greece, each civilization can accommodate different leaders. So first I'm going to cover the unique traits of the Polish Civ minus the leader the new leader for the Polish Civ, or the first and only leader, essentially, at the moment for the Polish Civ, uh, Jadwiga. Okay, so first for the Polish Civ, they have the ability to culture bomb, this is what Firaxis is calling it, other borders using either military encampments or forts. Now, in the early parts of the game, like this game that I'm in, you won't be able to build forts yet. So a military encampment can actually provide a rather interesting alternative to some sort of religious combat. For example, right here, if we take a look at the city, I am currently building a military encampment in it, and I'm building it right next to the borders right here of my rival, my religious rival, uh, Gandhi of India. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and rush the district by chopping these woods right here. And as you can see, with the district complete, it has now taken away some of Gandhi's borders here. And what this does, when paired with the leader bonus, which essentially converts cities that you take land away from, it can just converted Gandhi's city right here to my, my uh, religion, which provides some interesting bonuses. There's a lot of synergy there between Jadwiga and Poland. It should be noted that this ability though, this culture bombing ability, it will only extend three tiles from your main city. So in other words, this is essentially as far out as it's going to go for me if I built it. If I built a fort right here, it would only claim a couple of tiles to the sides. It would not expand further than that. And it should also be noted that when it comes to building forts with military engineers, you can only build them in your own borders to expand your borders. You're not going to be able to just spam them randomly around the area like outposts. And I think this was one of the areas that people were afraid was going to be overpowered about the civilization because they didn't quite understand how the borders expanded. But like I said, when paired with a Jadwiga's ability to convert cities that you have just taken territory away from, in this case it was India, I took a couple of their tiles away, and it's a pretty powerful synergy there between both civilization and leader. It should also be noticed that you, it should also be noted that you cannot take away wonders or districts from civilization. So in other words, if there was a wonder right here on this wheat and the district right next to the river, I would not have been able to claim them unless they were not finished building yet. So that might be an interesting alternative that you can use to sort of prevent an opponent from building a wonder. Simply plop a city down next to them, uh, rush build the district, or even just plop down a fort in that city if you have military engineers at this point, and you can sort of steal their wonder that was in progress from them. Okay, so next we're going to be covering the market replacement for Poland. This is a unique building called the Sukanisa, I believe. If we go here to look at the buildings, you can see I have it built in my commercial hub at the moment. And if we take a look at the Civilpedia, Civilopedia, I always get that wrong. We will see right here that in addition to the standard bonuses provided by a market, the Sukanisa also provides an additional two production for trade routes leaving my country or uh, an additional four gold for trade routes inside my country. So in other words, to exemplify this, I'm going to go to the trade routes overview and I have three total trade routes here. They all come from the same city, uh, and that city has a Sukanisa built in its commercial hub. So as you can see right here, I have one 
foreign trade route is going to a city state and i'm getting that additional plus two production even though the city state is actually a religious city state that usually or it currently does provide faith but usually you'd get the faith from a city state and i get it but i'm also getting additional two production because the sukanisa is adding that two production due to its special ability when we take a look at my internal routes, we're getting that additional plus four gold. So in other words, instead of just getting two gold from each of these, we're getting a total of six in addition to the regular bonuses of food and production. So that's all in all, that's a pretty strong building considering that you'll likely be building markets in pretty much all of your main cities. So uh, definitely not a, not a unique building to take lightly. It's a very good one. Another unique ability that applies to the Polish Civ exclusively, we're going to have to go here to the government and we can view the policies. At the moment, you will see that I don't have the ability to use them. I'm just going to unlock all of them for some gold and to demonstrate this. So you'll notice I don't have any military policies at the moment, and that's because one of my military policies is going to be turned into a wildcard policy. Now, this is rather similar to Greece. Instead of, though, Greece has an entirely separate and additional wild card slot uh, in addition to the usual ones you start with so in other words if you're playing greece you'll start with a total of three card slots in your government uh, but when it comes to poland you're only going to start with the regular two but one of them instead of being a military policy is going to be a wild card policy and this is actually quite effective and plays very well into the synergies with poland as a religious sieve because it allows you to place down let me take a look at the research for that there is a it's actually a cultural research it allows you to research mysticism early on in the civics tree and this will give you an additional plus two great profit points per turn which can be quite vital in attracting a great profit very very early in the game uh, really the only other civilizations that come close are the ones that build the oracle or greece for example because they can essentially do the same thing since they have they also have that same wild card slot that they can use early on. So that makes Poland especially strong in terms of religion, even without the uh, the Jadwiga leader. But with her, it's definitely a more focused on religion. And we're going to cover that right after we finish looking at the winged Hussar, which is their unique unit. So as you can see here, we're currently in a scenario, but this scenario has all the same text. And to recruit the winged hussar, we're going to actually need to look at the civics tree instead of the research tree. So under the mercenaries civic, once you have completed it, uh, you're going to be able to access the winged hussar, which is a medieval unit that costs three maintenance of gold and 250 production to build on the standard speed. Now right here is a scenario that I was playing. It is focuses on Poland. It's the scenario that comes with the DLC. So right here, for example, is a winged hussar. Here's another one. And I guess we're going to have to end the turn. Turn 60. Oh, this is turns already over. Maybe I can use one over here. A lot of these seem to be out of movement points. Okay, here is a winged hussar that still has movement points. So as you can see, they get a pretty decent bonus against them. It's 55 strength. Let's go ahead and attack this. What is this? It's a musketman. So attack the musketman with the winged hussar. So as you can see, after combat, the musket man was pushed one tile back, and that's really the winged Hussar's strongest suit. Uh, overall, I don't think it's a great feature. I, I mean, maybe I'm missing something, but in general, it's good for defense, but not so good for offense because it it causes you to push forward far faster than you'd like. For example, if I'm over here and I'm attacking units across this river, if I normally would have a unit on this side of the river they could exchange blows for a couple of turns before the unit was killed and then it was actually pushed and i actually pushed onto the other side of the river with my unit but with the winged hussar all i have to do is attack once the unit it attacked will not be killed but it will be pushed back regardless because of the winged hussar's ability and this means that it puts your units in danger because when you push too far into enemy territory it means that all the enemy units can swarm your unit and kill it and this is what has happened to me for example right here where i pushed too far into this because of that now normally a regular unit would still be positioned right here in the wheat tile because the musket man is not dead and that means that fewer units can hit my mounted unit that attacked right so now i'm pushed i've pushed way in here let's pretend there are a couple more units here a crossbowman right there and another musket man here and next turn they'll all attack they all have the ability to attack 
this single unit and they'll kill it because I'm pushing too fast outside. So it might be a good defensive unit and which sort of applies to the scenario because the scenario is designed to be defensive. But as an offensive unit, I have not found a practical use for it in my opinion. And it is also a little bit difficult to get compared to knights because looking at the exact specs for it, it does upgrade to a tank, but there is no unit that it upgrades from. So this is definitely going to put it at a disadvantage because it means you have to build it right out of the clear blue you don't really get to start with anything and a lot of units in civilization are going to be upgraded from former units because they will retain their experience so it just makes them more powerful it's beneficial to keep upgrading those units all the way up so with the wing to star you're going to have to build them pretty much out cold and then you also have to you won't be able to upgrade them till the tank but at least they have an upgrade path which is important so overall i would say in my opinion the wing to star is probably one of the weaker aspects to the polish civilization but that does cover the Polish civilization, but we still have the leader, Jadwiga, to talk about next. So as I've mentioned before, Jadwiga is the most obvious choice for Poland because Poland already has very religious leaning tendencies, so she complements that quite nicely. In addition to the ability that I mentioned before, that is whenever you claim territory from another civilization using the culture bomb, a unique ability of Poland itself, uh, and she converts nearby cities to see we're gonna go over this again right now delhi has hinduism as its major religion we're going to go ahead and chop this forest here and now you can see it's converted over to ether eastern orthodoxy uh the, i know that's historically not accurate but what has happened here is due to jadwega's ability to convert cities that you've claimed territory from using your civilization's culture bomb ability. But in addition to this ability, relics also generate an additional four gold, two culture, and two faith. Now, I don't have any relics to show you, and by and large, it's not very easy to get relics, so this is not especially a big deal, but it is, it just goes on to further synergize the faith approach for the Poland and the Poland Civ with the Jadwiga as a leader. And she also gets a double adjacency bonus for holy sites now this is a rather nebulous thing so if we take a look here at this holy site and we take a look at what we're getting from it right now it says worked tiles we're getting seven from the districts seven from the holy site and i'm not exactly sure how it multiplies but if we go into a civil a city that does not have a holy site built and we try to build one this is a really unfortunate thing in my opinion that the game does not show us full time where the adjacency bonuses are coming from on the map but now we can see where we would get faith adjacency bonuses when placing the holy site as jadwiga and as you can see right here we're getting an additional faith from this adjacent district even though it's only one of them there's only just the main city district right there and we're still getting a plus one faith adjacency bonus normally you would need two adjacent districts to get that one faith adjacency bonus so it's looking like uh, it like pretty much double the adjacency bonus in other words you're going you're going to get one faith for each uh, adjacent district that you have to the holy site if we put that down there just like that and then i built say a adjacent a district right here and a district right there that would add an additional two faith. And that's pretty much what's happened here. We have the holy site right here, that we have the commercial hub right across the river from it, but it is adjacent. And then we also have the city square, which is uh, adjacent to it as well. The city center, it's called. So once again, it's a nice boost to faith production, especially early on. Uh, help make sure that you can get and spread your religion very early as Poland. And lastly, for the leader, and this only applies to the AI, her agenda is tries to build faith and likes other civs that do as well. So in other words, if you're a civ with a lot of faith or you're generating a lot of faith, she will like you. If you're low on faith or you ignore faith, Shadwiga will like you less as well. Now, in terms of where the game will go from here and why Firaxis did what they did with uh, Poland. This is not the first time that they've made Poland a very attractive sieve, although I think they've sort of tempered it and the immediate reaction to it by a lot of people was actually a bit overblown. It doesn't appear to be nearly as overpowered as some thought, especially in multiplayer, because while a lot of these abilities are pretty powerful in single player, such as the ability to take land, 
via culture bombing, especially when you can use forts when advancing forward, it's not going to be all that useful in multiplayer because it's not exactly the same. The AI is just a lot dumber in single player than a human opponent would be in a multiplayer, but it still could be a thorn in your side if your civs ever get too close. In addition to this, all the faith advantages are usually null because in a lot of multiplayer games, uh, faith does not play a very big role. So it's looking like a very strong single player civ, but overall, probably not going to replace any of the current favorites in multiplayer, despite it having some very great bonuses. So that covers the civilization Poland and its leader Jadowiga, but we also have a scenario to take a look at that came along with this DLC. So let's go back to the main menu and then take a look at that. So if we go to single player and then go to scenarios, we can see right here, Jadwiga's legacy is the scenario we want to play. And we have the choice of three different civilization leaders. All of them are just represented by flags. And I'm actually going to load up a game that I was in progress of playing for this scenario and talk a little bit about the scenario itself. So here we are in the Polish or Jadwiga's legacy scenario, one turn away from victory. And as you can see, what's going on here is essentially we're being invaded from pretty much all sides by various different factions. Up here we have the barbarians, the Swedish barbarians, I guess, or Swedish and Russian barbarians. Down here we have the Teutonic Knights, I believe, and the Moldovians, the Golden Horde, all those kind of units. They're all essentially barbarians. And then right down here we have the Ottomans. Some people have suggested that this hints to an upcoming Ottoman civilization, but we really don't know that because all they essentially have here is the, uh, the Janissary. So that's one unit, not all that significant towards pointing to a new civilization being the Ottomans, but it's certainly possible now that they have introduced the unit at least. So what you did in this scenario, you had the option to start as one of three uh, civs. You had right here, this is uh, Poland, I believe. That civ, this civ right here, and then one up here. Now overall, I played this scenario on the standard difficulty, and you would think that Firaxis would balance the match for the standard difficulty, because that's the one that you can pretty reliably expect a lot of uh, players, both hardcore and not, to maybe play it on. Well, maybe not hardcore, but a lot of players are going to get, the average player would likely play it on this scenario. Uh, and this scenario on that level. Now, what I found out is that the horde it didn't it didn't really ever threaten me at all. Uh, probably for the first 20 turns, I barely built any units, and they mostly just marched around over here by these other city states. I continually got messages saying that a city state was under siege, but nothing ever happened of it. Like they'd kill some of the units, and then eventually the city state would be able to repel the attack, and then the barbarians would throw more units down. It really did not seem to ever be threatened, so I never had to come to their aid. Uh, none of them actually got removed, and none of my cities got captured because they barely ever attacked me here. Uh, most of the time, it was me advancing towards them, and that was actually not exactly a feasible decision. It's not a feasible strategy, because even though, like right here we have the barbarian camp, that's where all these units spawn from. Even destroying the barbarian camp will not stop the units from spawning, and not revealing the territory will not prevent the units from spawning. So I learned this the hard way. I marched a whole bunch of units down here, and I was surrounded by barbarians like a couple turns later, because it was the, the map had been scripted to spawn a whole bunch of barbarian units down a couple turns later. And I just so happened to be in the middle of it, I had to reload to avoid losing a good few units because these units are fairly powerful, the barbarian units. But overall, it's just like there wasn't a whole lot of challenge to it. And I've heard the same applies to it sort of on harder difficulty levels. What I've read from people who did play it on deity difficulty, uh, the same sort of applied where the city states were never ever captured by the barbarians. And it actually helped by playing it on the deity level, the other AIs in the area that are your allies because they got into an additional two settlers. Like I said, you would think the game would be, this scenario would be balanced for the standard difficulty. And it really doesn't, you're never under any real threat at that difficulty. But then when you play it on the hardest difficulty level, you're allies have a whole leg up and since they're on your side it's not actually a bad thing but it, it would be a little bit more difficult i'd imagine due to the bonuses that are provided in combat and just the general ability for the barbarians to easily swarm you when you're not as it you're not quite as able to build and maintain quite as strong of an army one positive thing i've heard about the scenario is that it does play quite well into the unique unit and the unique district ability uh, we have for example 
the ability to expand cultural borders by placing down the encampments. And since the encampments can fire, the ideal strategy here was to group a lot of cities close to each other with uh, encampments on the exteriors and have a ring of winged hussars along the exteriors as well. This would allow the winged hussars to attack and push back enemy units that came within your borders. And then the encampments would have, would have crossbowmen in them that could fire on them, as well as actually firing themselves, providing the city had built the standard wall defense that enables firing from both the city district tile and the military encampment. So that pretty much covers the Polish DLC for Civilization VI. It included the Poland Civilization, the Polish leader Jadwiga, and this scenario. That was it. Uh, it was available for $5 at launch. People who actually bought the premium version of Civilization VI, it was like the golden extended some kind of version, they actually got this for free as well as the other scenario, the Vikings scenario. When I say free, I say that in quotes because they obviously paid for it beforehand. Uh, and this, these two scenarios count towards the total of four different DLC pieces that they were promised to get from Firaxis post-launch. So we've seen two of them already, two more to go. Some people have been disappointed in the quality of content and the amount of it. I personally do not regret it, but I, would, I think it would have been a lot fairer if the, the Vikings and the Polish had been combined and sold them together for $5. I would have been a lot happier with it. But overall, that is... Uh, I had, I had fun playing it, and I think that's what's important. I played both scenarios to their completion, and I only played them on the standard difficulty level because I am not somebody who really relishes all that all that high of a difficulty. Like, I am more interested in just playing it the casual style. That's my style, and I, I can respect other people who actually want to experience some sort of challenge from the AI, but that is generally not why I play the game. I had fun playing both of the scenarios, as I said. Uh, overall, I would say I rated the Viking scenario higher than this one, but overall, I think the Polish civilization as a whole and as an addition to the base game is definitely has more replayability value than a handful of city-states that you might encounter and you might not, unless you actually select your city-states. You know, it's a random toss of the dice whether or not you're going to get the new ones that were included in your DLC, right? So anyway, I hope you, you found that informative. If you have any additional questions about either of the DLCs, especially the Poland DLC, because it's the one I'm reviewing here, uh, feel free to ask me about them in the comment section below. I did spend a good couple of days researching and playing this entire scenario, so I would be able to give you an informed opinion on it, so I should be able to help you answer any questions you might have about it. Otherwise, thank you very much for watching as always, and I hope to see you next time.